I have the dubious pleasure of being the last thing that stands between you and the final coffee break. <laughs> um, as you can probably tell, yet another NARS presentation. It's a very grand sounding title. For those that are already going to sleep, it's not as bad as it sounds. So, this is a paper authored by myself and my co-author Patrick Hammer, who you just heard from. First of all, what's the issue here? Well, you've already heard NARS is a reasoning system, um, usually used by principal cognition. Um, it uses a term logic as well. And a requirement of a term logic is that the two premises Patrick mentioned that are selected need to have a common term in order for the inference rules to work. But this actually becomes a problem when you want to generate an arbitrary relation between incoming strings that have no common term. So for example, we have a, a premise AB and a premise CD. There is no common term. Um, so suddenly the, the elegance of the term logic lets you down. So how do we deal with that? I'm not going to bore you with the, the NARS operating cycle for the third time in this conference, so we'll skip over that. First of all, let's just take a little look at um, temporality. And I have to be honest, I'm not even sure whether temporality is a word, but it sounded right to me. <laughs> so temporality is a form of semantic relation. Um, premises in NARS have two temporal variants, uh, eternal, um, which are true to a degree, as uh, you'll keep hearing from us. Um, so it's true forever, at all times. Um, or events, which are true to a degree for a, uh, a moment in time or a temporal interval. For now, we're just going to consider events. Uh, first of all, time in NARS is not world time. Um, it's measured by the number of system cycles and not by clock time. So time is relative or subjective. Um, and each event in the system, and Pei and Patrick have both mentioned events, each event has a property which we call occurrence time. That is its, its interval when it will occur. Um, occurrence time can be considered in three broad classes. Um, we call them retrospective, concurrent and predictive, which essentially are fan fancy words for past, present and future. When we, uh, when we look at uh, events in this way, we can categorize them as um, having occurred historically, or ha occurring now, or occurring in the future. And the, the difference between two occurrence times, uh, in relative terms, will determine whether one is in front of the other at the same time as another, or, or before another. Um, But what do the same time mean at the same time? It's not such a simple idea. Um, you can't just say two things happening in exactly the same cycle time. That's it, pretty uh, just, um, restrictive. So we, we take taken some research um, into human psychology. And it turns out that, that humans actually consider things concurrent when they happen within a, a temporal duration window of, of approximately 80 milliseconds. Um, that allows for different travel times of signals up your, you know, your, your toe and your arm touching things simultaneously, although the amount of time it takes for those signals to travel is actually different. Um, so we use this idea of a, of a temporal window for concurrency. So anything happening within that window we regard as concurrent. Now we don't use 80 milliseconds, because that's quite a long time in computer terms, um, but it, it can be. It can be, in fact, tailored to a specific application um, so the example I use is um, if you're monitoring chemical interactions, you want a, a duration window of probably a small number of nanoseconds, uh, whereas if you're monitoring whale migration, um, you know, you can use a much bigger time window because it's not so critical to be precise. The, the primary role of, of temporal concurrency really is to allow us to form um, temporal sequences uh, of, of co-occurring items. So in order to do this, we've introduced this idea of temporal concepts. Conceptually, a very simple idea. Um, you saw Patrick demonstrate 
concepts in general. Um, temporal concepts are a specialization. Um, it's, a, it's a concept, the same as we saw before, except it's named by an occurrence time rather than a term. So the example here is concept 512. It's a concept that relates to content with occurrence time of 512. Um, that would contain tasks that occurred at that occurrence time. So again, we saw from Patrick's demonstration that uh, tasks um, go inside concepts. Here, there's two examples, um, AB occurring at 512, CD occurring at 512, um, and the bag would uh, fill up within that concept of concept related to that based on their priority. Um, but they would all have the same current time and yet different semantic meanings. I'm going to skip that piece. Right, so temporal inference. So how do we use these concepts to get temporal induction? Straightforwardly, we select two temporal concepts based on priority uh, from the control system. We then apply the now temporal induction rules. Uh, and because the, um, the concepts are just concepts, we, we can apply the rules in exactly the same way as we do for general inference. A couple of examples here, um, or some temporal rules. So the P and the S, um, two premises, S um, predicts P. So for example, if S occurs first, uh, and then P follows sometime later, uh, from an induction perspective, S predicts P. Um, if S and P occur at the same time, um, S and P are equivalent. Uh, there's temporal variations of these rules in the details there. Uh, concurrent prediction, uh, concurrent uh, concurrency, um, and there's various versions of these to enable the system to work with forward and backwards uh, temporal inference. I won't go into all the details of that. temporal information as a form of semantic relationship. Uh, previously, we thought of terms as a way of relating premises. Now we can think of the temporal information encoded in their occurrence time as a, a form of semantic relationship. And through that connection, we can now form um, inductive relationships. Um, with this approach, it allows us to do inference between arbitrary premises, which the term logic wouldn't allow. And, and the, last, the last point here is that the introduction of these temporal concepts has actually fitted in seamlessly into the existing architecture. So there's been no uh, additional requirements to make changes to the system. So I, I really like the, uh, the explanation from one of the previous speakers about uh, elegant uh, functional design. Um, we still maintain a single unified principle with a simple architecture. Uh, the only variance we would have between Patrick's big picture view and now is that some of the concepts are temporal versus general concepts. Other than that, it's exactly the same architecture. So with that as a conclusion, I'll wrap that up. It's probably the fastest presentation of the entire conference. <laughs>